recording. All right, let's go. So, do you, how do I, I am nothing more than a messenger. Do you slideshows? I do it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Here we go. All right, guys. So today we're going to talk about OSL or object source lighting. Um, basically, just painting something either on the miniature, and it doesn't even have to be on the miniature, but paint, painting something so that we look like we're getting glowing light, right? That's that's what we're after here. Um, this is from one of my favorite web tutorials. It's on this website called Light Miniatures. This guy, Alfie, uh, David, he's got a great written primer that I would recommend to check out. I'll, I'll post a link to it after this. Um, that's definitely sort of the first place that I landed when I was trying to figure out this technique and the approach, and he's got some really good points. Um, so some of the information from that's coming from here. Some of it, I've taken class with Eric Swinson on OSL. He's a great teacher in the subject too. So um, that's this is going to be a synthesis of that, my own experience and everything. Um, so here's like the basic rules uh, when we're looking at object source lighting. Um, the first and, and foremost in my mind is the one that I see people miss 90% of the time is that whatever object, if the object is actually in the scene, uh, whatever that object is, it has to be brighter. And, and when I say brighter, I mean like in value, like in a scale of black to white, right? It has to be the closest element to white, you know, especially compared to the glow that it is throwing around it. Uh, a lot of the times what I will see is like a, a medium orange lamp throwing this bright yellow glow onto things. And for a variety of reasons, that doesn't make any sense. Um, similarly, uh, OSL really is effective based on its contrast in comparison to the rest of the model. So areas that are lit by your, your glowing object, they need to be brighter than their surrounding areas. Um, the example that I like to think about for this is like if you're, you know, looking at your phone in the daylight, right? If somebody were looking at you in that scenario, they're not really going to see any of the light that the phone is throwing on your face because there's so much other light around, right? Compare that to if you were in a completely dark room and now you're looking at your phone, that's the that's the source of, of light lighting everything, right? There's, there's nothing competing with it at that point. So it's going to be that much more noticeable and that much more effective. Um, and that feeds into the second thing too, you know, the OSL effect should be the, the brightest thing on your overall model. There's a few times where this changes maybe, like if you're also doing really shiny NMM on the model, maybe that's competing with it too, and it should because it makes sense. But in general, you want to try and keep the rest of the model fairly dark in comparison. And I don't mean that like the whole model has to be painted dark and then you only get your light from the OSL, but you want to think about the composition of light overall in the model more with OSL because you're trying to save that that big contrast and value for your glow effect. That's how it's going to become the, the you know it's going to show the most effectively. Um, one of the other most important rules: light only travels in straight lines. Uh, light doesn't bend. Um, so when you're planning out sort of the path of of your light, if you do things that are illogical, you know our human brain is going to pick up on it. Uh, without you even realizing it. You're going to look at something and, and be like, well, why is the light over there? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so you do have to be thoughtful planning out where your light is going to reach. And to that point, light has decay, right? And, and what I mean that is that the further something is from the source of the light, the weaker the light is going to be. You know, depending on the initial strength of the light, that could be very quickly. That could be you know, maybe your, your phone flashlight only goes, say, 10 feet, right? Uh, a much more powerful flashlight, maybe you'll get 50 feet out of it. But that's something you do have to take into account, because if you just blast the same value of, or the same intensity of light everywhere from this, and it's not sort of tracking back towards the, the object itself, and in, in increasing and increasing, it just doesn't sell the effect as well. It just looks like this, it, it looks wrong, it's flat. You don't get the sense that like, okay, this is brighter here than it is back there. Um, the last thing's not something we're gonna go too, too much in because it's kind of this really insane deep rabbit hole, but it is something to consider, right? Like the color of your light and then the color of the object that it is shining on, that is going to have interactions. Um, one of the things I see all the time is like, you'll, you'll see like red armor with this bright green 
glow on it. Um, that's not going to look like that. If you shine a green light onto something that's red, it's going to look almost black. Um, just because of the way light and color work. It, it's Says you. Says the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> says, uh, says everything about the way light and color work. Um, this is something that I'm happy to dive into a little bit more. I don't want to bog everyone down with this because it's honestly, it's uh, to start with, go ahead, paint that green light over red armor. It doesn't matter. Who cares? You're figuring out how to accomplish the, the actual glowing part of it first. I consider this much more of like a nuanced thing, you know, uh, like if you have gold armor and there's blue light on it, it's going to make it green uh, because, you know, <laughs> blue and yellow light make green. Um, but again, we don't have to go down that road right now. It's just something I want to throw out there to kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you enjoy doing this and you want to start pushing it, that's something to factor in. That'll make your, your stuff look more believable. It'll, it'll, you know, be more nuanced. It'll be more interesting. Um, I don't have too, too much after this in terms of stuff to look at, but just to make a few points, right? Like, you know, today we're going to paint a Star Wars model because I think that lightsabers are a really, really good place to start with OSL. Um, it's something fairly recognizable to everyone. There's a lot of reference images out there that you can go look at to get a sense of, you know, how this is supposed to work. Um, so I implore you, I, I like Shatterpoint models. They're pretty cheap per model. If you really want to mess around with OSL, grab a couple of lightsaber models, paint the same one 20, 30 times, whatever, just play around with it. Um, and here though, I think one of the things that I, that I really like to point out, right? Like, yeah, we all know he's got a red lightsaber, but the lightsaber is not red, right? It's white. Um, and this is sort of to the point of like, this is where your glowing object should be. It should basically almost be white, depending on the intensity of the light you're trying to show. Right? Like maybe a small lantern, you're not going to go anywhere near white. It's got a little candle in it. It's just not creating that much energy. But for something really intense like this, or like plasma in something like Warhammer 40k, something along those lines, you want to go to almost pure white. Um, and the object itself, you can see, really doesn't have much color. It's the color context around it that can really let you just sell what color light it's throwing without having to paint the object red, right? Because we all know, especially in this case, trying to paint red, highlight it up, you get pink. You don't want to just have him holding a pink stick. It looks kind of dumb. Um, so I tend to just paint the mostly white with a little bit of color and then let the context of the color that it's throwing around it sell what color this thing is. Um, similarly here, you can kind of get the idea of, of decay here, right? Like if you look at here, where it's the closest to the object, it's somewhat blown out it's near white but not, still not as bright as the object right and then it's fading off in intensity and saturation as we move further away from the object and this is this is that decay right here right like you can see sort of this arc of where the the light from the saber is no longer being thrown and now you have the environmental light coming in instead um this is still creating a brighter light than the overall scene is. So you get that intensity, you get that really glowing sense. <clears throat> Furthermore here, there's even like a, you know, a color contrast happening here between like warm and cool tones, just making the contrast even more. That's a little bit more uh, advanced down the road, but it's, you know, composition all plays into it. Um, I think another thing here that is important to, to think about too is that the materials that your, you know, light is falling onto, you they have to be considered too because they still need to be rendered the same, right? Like if this is a shiny material, it's going to reflect more light than if it was this sort of maybe more matte material down here, um, and that's where you can start to sell the material itself with the light on it still, so it's not just blowing out all information. I, that's something I see early on with a lot of people is that they render everything the same with the light, nothing shinier or more matte. Um, again, that's why this, the Star Wars models are really great. They're usually only a couple of the different fabrics or materials, so you can play around with the different rendering pretty well um, without having to consider a million things at once. You know, similarly, if this is bright enough to glow off his face, that's going to look different than it would off of this material or here or anything like that. Um, this is just another good example of, of light decay. Right, like up here, closest to the light, this is 
just about the same value as this. If you were actually to look up into this light, it would be a lot brighter, but we're not looking at it directly. Um, but as we get, you know, down further and further, it's it lowers a lot in intensity, right? And that's that's something to keep in mind. Um, the way that I kind of go about this, you know, when, when we look at it, is mostly like it's layering, right? I like to just use basic layering to do OSL because it's an easy way to do it. And you don't have to mess around too much. Um, we'll get into that when we actually start painting. I can't remember if I did another one. Oh yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is from Arnaud Lazaro. Um, I like his examples a lot because he's just a fantastic painter. You know, if you're imagining that the inside of his hand is glowing here, darkening around it in the scene really helps sell this idea that this is glowing, this is lighting him up, this is the source of light that, that, we're, that we're viewing everything from. Obviously there's other environmental light still, but it's not competing with this. And that's an important thing when you're when you're putting the whole figure together is to think about where are your other lights coming from, how strong they're gonna be. Because um, again, you don't wanna just leave the figure black basically and just paint the OSO. I mean, maybe you do, maybe it's the look you're going for. But if you wanted to render it all out, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. All right. So from here, we'll go ahead and just hop right in. Let me just switch over. Um, I gotta go here. Yeah, okay. All right. Can we see the camera now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's get to it. Anybody got any questions about the technical portion so far? Feel free to throw them out there. Put them out there. Put them out there, guys. Is this um, video going to be recorded and posted online? Yes. Okay. I'll be posting it to my YouTube. I'm going to post it, the link to that in our in our channels like we normally do. So um, this will be available, you know, for free forever on as long as the internet stays up, I suppose. Anyway, so um, here's the model we're going to be looking at today. Uh, this is Obi one I already went ahead and painted his light super white, and this is how I like to start this, is to paint whatever my object is going to be white, um, just so I have that reference point of like, okay, brightest value is always going to be here. I'm not going to paint over it for a while. I'm just going to leave that there as sort of a reference. Um, wh what I think is really the, the best approach that I think about this is to consider where the, the object is and look at it in relation to the rest of the model, right? I know it's a little hard to see because he's prime black, but for instance, it's the closest to his head, right? That's the closest object to him. So the side of his head and everything is going to be really washed out with light. It's going to fall off down his face. Let me use a brush to point this stuff. It's maybe a little easier. Um, the light's going to fall off a little bit as it moves down his face onto this, this breastplate thing here, which if I imagine this metal, it's going to be quite reflective and really shine this back. And then, you know, if you consider it from the side here, right, like straight down, I don't, it's not really going to hit his lower robes. There's just no path of light from there to there. And that, this is what I try and look and consider, right? Like, can I draw a straight line from the thing to the next thing where I want to put light? If I can't, the light doesn't go there, right? Like maybe a little bit would make it pass and catch the top of his belt here. Some's going to hit these shoulder pads. Some's going to hit along the side of his arm, this shoulder pad, the side of this arm, maybe a little bit down. Come on, focus. Maybe a little bit down here on this arm. So. To start, I'm just going to make, I'm going to imagine he has a blue lightsaber. I don't know if that's correct. I don't care. Maybe it's green. I don't know. I'm going to use blue. I want to use blue. What color is his lightsaber? <laughs> I mean, that's not a question. Yeah. What color is his lightsaber? Blue. Okay. We're it's right. We're doing, all the we're, doing, we're doing, we're doing canonical. Obi today, I guess. Canonical? Oh my god, I love Star Wars canonical. It's my favorite canon. My favorite type of canon. Um, yeah. Again, you know, uh, as always, like, the actual colors you're using doesn't really matter. I'm going to use a few different things. Um, right now, I'm just, I'm playing around with these new uh, Atom Paints that just came out. They're kind of fun. But we, we'll talk more just in broad of, of what 
we're going to do on here and not specific about using products, right? So for this, I want to make a dark, a dark blue to start because <coughs> that's going to be the first thing I like to do is paint the entire reach of where the glow is going to go. Um, so for this, I'm going to take blue and just mix a little bit of black into it to get something kind of akin to a, um, let's see if I can slide my palette up here so you can see what I'm doing with this. Um, something almost like a dark sea blue, maybe a little bit more saturated, but um, it where the extent of the glow is, is going to be your, your least saturated point, right? Because as the light falls off in intensity, it also falls off in, in saturation. Um, it's not bringing as much color information along with it. So we'll just go ahead and grab some of this. And we're going to mark out those areas that we we're that we we're looking at, right? So basically this whole thing more or less is going to be catching some light a little bit in the top of the robe. Shoulder pads here. Center of the arm. Sorry for the uh, focus isn't great, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll make it work. I keep my hand behind me. That'd be a little better. Um, right. So just marking out everywhere where we know the light is gonna fall, and like most things that involve sort of more advanced lighting, you know, I would like OSL, NMM stuff like that. Like having a good sense for the volumes of the model is really gonna help sell this effect. Um, so I would, you know, I did a, another video if you wanted to go check it out on painting volumes. Um, learning how to interpret the volumes of a model is huge because it really helps sell the the light, you know, like the idea, the control, the placement of light. Um, so again, we're going to go in here, right? Like this is going to be able to hit his collar a little bit side of his neck and do his beard and face and today we're going pretty um rudimentary rough and ready you know like with anything you can refine this stuff for for hours and hours and hours and hours but um for today we're just going to kind of do the the rough and ready version of it right so now we've got we've demarcated sort of the extent of where the glow is going to go. Right. And even now, like even with just this little bit, it's, it's already starting, right? Like you can get a sense, even though this thing's white, because now there's this blue glow around. And as we work up to it, it's just going to start coming out. Wow. You're right. It already looks blue. Holy moly. Look, if you put blue on, then people know it's blue. I don't know if you guys have figured that part out yet, but. Well, that's uh that's pretty crazy even down here i think we'll, we'll just pretend that it catches a little a little light down on the top of this thing maybe the edge of these and stuff and that's just it too like you can always go back and, and adjust a little bit um i much like our earlier processes we've done here i really like to work with simple blurry. Strokes first you're blurry um so this is a good place to like really check it. Like, okay, does where I put blue make sense, right? Before you start adding anything else, check check now. Did I put put it somewhere where it's not a straight line, where it's impossible to get to? Fix that while you're still just working with black and white. Because um, as, as soon as you start going up into the layers and, and everything, it just makes it that much harder to adjust things, right? Like if we're just working in a really basic step, uh, adjusting everything's a lot easier. I really kind of need more light here or something. I don't know. Under. Hold on, let me try something. That was a little better, huh? Yeah. Wow, that's brighter. Is it is, is it is it good? You see? Yeah, it looks fun. Okay, cool. All right, so now we're gonna move up into more of a saturated blue. Um, and again, we got to start thinking about the volumes of everything as we're going to apply this next layer, right? It's just like it, it's highlighting, right? Like the thing that I always like to think about is when you paint normally and you're going to paint like the sun or Zen, you know, like the sun from a Zenithal or whatever is lighting your model and you start painting stuff to that, 
that's OSL. It's just the sun's the object. It's super far away, and you're going to interpret it a little bit differently. When it's up close, the the demarcation of the lights a lot more visible. But it's the same ideas. There's no there's no difference in like okay, how do I approach painting the highlights? Just highlight it. Just do it. You already know how to do it. Now do it. All right, so we're gonna get this brighter blue. And we'll start going in here with it on the top, All right? Because this is kind of almost like a you know like a cylinder across his chest here, right? So we'll go in with some of that. Especially because we know this is shiny, so this is going to get the brightest reflections overall across anything. Again, his arms are cylinders, right? So we're going to render them as cylinders, which is long linear highlights across the length of it. Here, it's going to hit the edges even, right? Because when you have hard surfaces, Hard edges, light catches them. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, like the edges of the shoulder pads and everything. The top of the robe is going to catch a little bit more. And of course, in the face, it's going to hit his cheekbone, the side of his nose more. And here, side of the neck a little bit, into the hair. You know, and this is obviously sort of an, an, an extreme example of the light, right? Like we're really, when we're doing this, we're letting it wash everything out. We're not retaining any of the original color information because we just want to be kind of extreme in the example of, of what we're doing. Um, and then from here, we got to go up a little bit. So I'll add just a little bit of white, make a little bit brighter of a color. You can see down here. And even at this point too, I might take something like this and really thin it down and think about working some of it into the, the ends of the saber a little bit, just to give a little bit of that color information into this thing. You know, that transition's pretty abrupt, but we can always just kind of come in and with some white and feather it out a bit. But then we will take that brighter blue tone from down here and start working it into where we know we want our brightest reflections to shine. All right, so the top of this shape, under here a bit, again up into here, middle of this volume. face because it's so close but again so far we're still quite a few steps down in value from this white right like this is still very noticeably the brightest element in this whole configuration and that's what you really have to keep in mind is that it has to stay that way or it just does not look right um, the second that anything down here is brighter than here, something screwy. Right, so we'll what do you do when the light is not as in, not so intense that it covers the original color completely? I.e., how do you do trans like light that would you know tint to other colors rather than take them over entirely? Sure. I mean, so that's when you really need to start like considering how colors of light interact right um you know when, when we mix color right it's it's subtractive with with pigments whereas here i'll just i'll just show an example over here let me, let me just pop back real quick because this will be easier to explain it this way um Right, so with additive color, right, when you're when you're adding all the colors together, you get white. Subtracted color, this is paint. You add them all together, you get black. So now you have to start thinking about how these overlaps work, right? For example, like 
if you're going to have blue shining onto green, it needs to be this, it needs to change into this sort of cyan color. Um, so that's the consideration you need to make. Like, it really references your friend, like everything else. Go look for colored light on stuff. Something that I really recommend too, if, if you really want to mess around with this stuff, is to get, um, you can get a really cheap set of these guys here. You can get these colored gels online that when you, you know, shine light through them, it, it, it changes the color of it, right? Like you can see here how I'm just putting it between the light in my hand, it's making it orange. Um, grab one of these, throw it over your light, shine it on whatever you're trying to paint, and it's going to give you a lot of information to work from. Would you normally paint on black first and then add color information of the original material later or do it differently? So like in this case, if I was starting this model and I wanted to block everything in, I it's hard to describe. Let's see. So let's say, let's say the rest of this guy is going to be like tans and stuff, right? Um, for that, I might start with something like, I don't know, this, let's say we're going to start with this like cork brown color. Um, course it's clogged cool everybody says they like dropper bottles but i'm still not sold they're still get annoying bad dropper bottles right if this is ak i mean come on get better ak ak third gen and it's clogged yeah dude what yeah you're not taking care of your dropper bottles bro don't you lecture me on my dropper bottles the deal is she don't you lecture me on my droppers all right yeah. Anyway, to, to kind of talk about that, basically, like, just treat the OSL, the range of the OSL light like um, another base coat, right? So if I was going to base coat, where's that big shitty brush? There it is. Shout out to big shitty Citadel shade brush. This thing, is the public programming. This thing rocks. You know, I'm going to just base coat the rest of this brown, right? Because that's, that's my starting point for this. Um, if, say, for example, the light was shining down onto his lower robes, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, let me just get this on, let it dry real quick. I'm just going to use my airbrush real quick to dry this. Bear with me. Where's the bear? You're the bear. Ooh. You're unbearable. <laughs> Got me. I really need to get a hair dryer again. What'd you do with your hair dryer? That's a good question. I don't know. It's just gone. Unbelievable. I know. Life goes and dryer on. a painter's best friend anyway so say we've got that right but i knew that i wanted to bring the osl down into this part well at this point i'm just going to take that um black blue color that we had been working with earlier that dark blue um and just get right in there with it you know okay this is going to go here you know, the light's going to hit these parts yes um get it on early uh, you know it doesn't uh I don't think it is any good to like go paint the whole model and then try and add OSL. Um, Cause again, even no here, right? Like we're in a stage where, okay, if this is wrong and I need to adjust it, great. I'm just taking this, this court color and okay, it doesn't go here. Great. I, I got to paint over it. Right. Like, cool. We're already just adjusting things, you know, at this stage. And you're not rendering the whole model out, and then that's the thing people fear, right? Like, oh, I want to do OSL, but I don't want to fuck up the model. Well, don't paint the whole model first and try to put OSL over it. It's not a good way of doing it. Um, do it from the beginning. Plan it out. Stick to it. This is easier to make work than the other thing. Because um, the other thing I see people do all the time, they paint everything, right? And then they just try and glaze a color over it. That's... Like we just talked about with light, that's not how it's going to work, you know? 
um, you putting the color over it's not the same as is what the color it should be is going to look like if that makes sense here I think maybe we just want to be a little more saturated in, it, in the middle and then we'll go up a little bit and so basically with like the where it's glowing on the model I, I'm probably not gonna go any brighter than that right that might even be a little too bright we'll have to see once it's on there but you know maybe that'll work for right in here where it's right next to his head and it's the closest and the most the most lights gonna go on to it but this isn't going to make sense to put like down here, right? This is too far. It shouldn't be the same as what's this close to it. And that's where you have to think about the decay is as it moves further away, it's going to be less and less and less. The highlights that are up here are going to be the brightest and they should never be that bright down here. Unless it's like an extreme difference in material, right? If this is all soft cloth up here, but then you had some metallic bits down here, they're probably going to catch this level of intensity just because of how much more reflective of material that metal is than if this was all cloth all right and even to that degree all of this i'm probably going to move up into this is too thin it's just running everywhere um my web palette's like a swamp today you know because this is like a, this hard reflective material that's in here I'm, i can move up into this this near white here but i'm not going to put it on the, the cloth Right? It wouldn't make sense to put it on the cloth. It's not as reflective as this material is. And that's where you get to play around a little bit and, and still, even though you're kind of blasting it with light, you can sell your materials a little more by playing with how much are they going to reflect the light compared to the other elements around them. Right? Like if his hand is bare, I guess here, right? it's hard to tell, it's going to reflect it a bit more than this woven fabric. Um, Things like that is where you can really add some more, you know, nuances in how the end result is going to look. Uh, and it is going to be a lot of back and forth. This isn't something that, like, generally you just go, okay, one, two, three, layer it up, we're all done, this looks perfect. You've got to play around with, with it like anything else. You're out of focus. Here you go. The base here. brown color is brighter than the darkest blue light. Is that okay? Th that this is brighter than the darkest blue light? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's again, this we weren't like this was. We're just thinking about this right now, right? Like this, this is just fucking around. This is just how I I would I would do it, right? Um. This wouldn't be this blue on this color because this color is kind of yellowish. This would be more green. Like, again, that's where you start going down that rabbit hole of like, okay, I probably wouldn't use this tone here on this because it just wouldn't make sense, right? I would also have to rework all of this if I wanted the light to feel like it was falling this far instead of up in this closer proximity. There's a there's a whole, it's, you can do it forever. It's kind of endless, unfortunately. You know, but for here, for this, you know, we're already kind of getting that that effect. And like I said, this is an extreme example. This is more just a kind of show you a little bit of it in action. Um, when you're actually doing this, you do want to be obviously a little cleaner. I'm just kind of sketching around. Um, but I think it gets the point across of like what what those concepts are and how they're translated on to doing it on a figure. Um, you know, maybe this is a little bit more reflective. You know, maybe this has a little shadow because it's overhanging. That's where you play around a little bit. Yeah, you just kind of go back and forth till you're happy.
catch the edges of this a little bit, catch inside this panel slightly. And then, you know, like anything else, once you've kind of got it where you like it, it's just a matter of, of refining it out and cleaning it up till it gets to the point where you're like, okay, this, this looks right to me. Cause I generally, I like to work really rough and then, and then refine down. Obviously not everyone wants to work this way. You can be more meticulous about building everything up. Uh, if you want to, I just, again, I, I like this because it allows for, for big changes quickly. Um, if something's not looking right. That's that's more or less it right there is you pick out the area, you figure out where you want your light to go, and then you start working up with within that sort of sphere or realm or whatever you want to call it of light, working up your volumes towards the source um, so that you get that sense of glowing of it reflecting that light off of the objects around it. Because that's what really sells it more than anything is, you know, not the object itself, but where the light that it's casting is hitting. You know, like I said, you can leave this relatively, the, the saber itself relatively devoid of information and still have it be, you know, effective in, in what it's selling. Just a little bit more hint of color in there. And again, if we did this, but then we also tried to light like the front of it with like strong frontal lighting, that's just two light sources competing. One, you know, this this is all going to get washed out if that's the case. If you did your other light kind of from back here to light the back of the model, right, it's going to look better. And that's one thing, like OSL, maybe not the best looking thing for gaming pieces a lot of the time. I mean, it can be cool if it's a small element that, you know, maybe works well from a bunch of angles, but with something like this, where it's sort of strong front directional, I, I mean, it could look cool, but I, it, it, for me, it's more of a display thing, um, you know, on the whole. I think if you're gonna do gaming stuff, just zhuzh it up with fluorescence and call it a day. Unless you unless you want to do this, I mean, if you like doing this, go go for it, go crazy. Um, I guess some places we could even go just the tiniest bit more up in value towards white. But again, you don't want to go too too much, or you steal the you steal the thunder from the glowing object itself, right? But maybe some just little pinpoints. where you've got your brightest reflections. Skin's pretty reflective, so up in here it might get pre-colorized. All right. Uh, this one's a little shorter than the other one's done, just because it's, I mean, it's not as many steps to it, but um, if anyone's got any questions, but hang out for a little bit longer and just kind of fart around here, so feel free to rattle them off if you got them. Nice. As always, thanks for coming to check these out. Uh, Love doing them for this place. Um, Red's been doing them too. If you're looking to step your stuff up in general, uh, definitely check out the um, service subscriptions with Red. Well worth your time, your money. Um, if you want to level a game up, go work with Red. You're gonna you're gonna like the results. Uh, they're gonna be quick to notice. He's a great teacher. Um. That's so sweet. I can attest. Yep, we got a lot of people in here, you know, who if you, you look at their work, it's definitely stepped up working with him. So um, I highly recommend it if you're trying to push up from where you currently are.
because it'll it can take you a long way. Man, I, I hate the focus on this f fucking camera, man. It's killing me. What camera is it? The 920? Same as you. Oh, you're, oh, this is the Sony? Yeah, this is my Sony, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I always just set it to manual and set it to set distance. Yeah, I should probably do that. I should probably try that next time. It do be working better, though. Loopholes has a question. What's if you were to finish the chest armor, which would be white, how would you go about doing that? Um, I mean, if this chest armor would be white, then it's not going to be white because it has colored light on it, and white reflects all colors, right? That's the thing about, like, the base material, right? If it's a black material, it's not going to reflect a ton of color, uh, but it'll reflect some. If it's white, it's going to reflect everything. So if this was originally, like, that white, plasticky, steely thing, you're not going to get any white left on it with this light shining on it, right? It's just going to blow it out. So I would just keep blending this out. Maybe you actually, since, you know, thinking if it, this was white underneath here, I would actually saturate the blue more onto it because um, it would be reflecting more of that tone more richly. So I would just, I mean, it would end up something basically like this for me if it would, if it was white with this shining on it. Right, if it was black, all of your reflections would be a little thinner um, and not quite as saturated, because especially blue on black doesn't reflect super well. Um, red tends to reflect a little bit better for whatever reason. Um, I don't know that much about math or science and light, but something, something, wavelength of light, I don't know. Um, but yeah, if it's a white object, I mean, you can imagine that whatever's shining on it is, it's going to carry a lot of color information. Um, now, if this chest plate was orange, right, this is going to be like a dark brown color. You shine blue light on an orange object, it, it creates dark brown. Um, so that's why, you know, I generally I advise away from doing complementary OSL, right? Like using a, a, a one tone onto a complementary of itself. It, it's you just make it muddy, you know? It makes it muddy really fast. So I would try and avoid that. Um, I also generally, because it's a pain in the ass, I try to avoid NMM and OSL interactions. You could do it. It's just a lot more work and a lot more head scratching to like get it right. Um, but like with anything, you can you can get there. You know, I don't think I like this black from Adam though. I'm not crazy about it. I'm just gonna black this out because I don't like the way it looks. For black, it doesn't cover very well. It's kind of weird. Oh, uh, someone asked earlier how the uh, the big child paints are. I, I like them. I think they're cool. Um, yeah, I mean they're they're paint, right? Like at the end of the day, don't don't expect anything too wild or crazy out of any anybody's acrylic paint. Uh, full disclaimer, <laughs> like there's it's acrylic paint, woo! But I think they're nice. Uh, I like the bottles, except they do basically have Chimera lids, but they're not. They don't turn into a crunchy mess up here, which is nice, and they go back in the bottle a bit more. Um, I think the set that they're selling right now is quite nice if you can get your hands on it, because it's 12 colors, um, generally very bright, saturated tones. These are not pure pigment. They're, there is white in all of these for opacity, but they're still very, very uh, juicy colors, right? Like this red... I actually think is one of the nicer um, reds that you can get just out of a bottle. It is very, um, very, very vibrant. Color covers pretty well. Um, very nice tone. I, I, I like it quite a bit. Um, and you can see too, like if I take their yellow, which again is also very very saturated yellow um, and the blue you can see that you can mix a nice saturated green from it still um, 
so they're relatively clean right like I'm not getting any sort of brown muddy tones out of this even though they do have some other pigments in them for, for opacity and stuff um, but as far as the set goes I think it's pretty sweet because you get kind of a pretty killer basic set of colors right like you get all of your um, you get all your your secondaries right you get your purple orange and, and green already done so you, you can get these nice and saturated still uh, you do get your classic red blue yellow you also get a magenta um, then they do black and white pretty normal uh, you get sort of a basic Caucasian skin tone base and then they do a nice uh, ochre and burnt umber um, so you get a nice brown and browny yellow so as far as like a set of paints for anyone to pick up and start playing around with, I think they're pretty nice if you're if you want to jump into mixing right out, out the gate. Because um, again, because it is a limited set, you do have to mix quite a bit if you wanted a, a brighter range of tones. But they're fun. I was playing around with them on this uh, yesterday. You can see the reds really really juicy and saturated under the desaturated part where I started highlighting. Um, so yeah, they've been fun to play around with. I, Loopholes I wants to know where you got that guy from. This this is a Hera model. Um, it's called Mayo M E I Y O. Um, it's a fun model. Also, Pumarogo asks. I feel a bit stupid asking this, but I'm wondering how adding the color after I finish the OSL works. Do I just add it to the places not hit by the OSL and then blend it or something at the edges or Blend it at the edges or something like that. You read that again? Hold on. It's basically like... I think they're assuming you paint the OSL before you do any other colors. And then how do you add the colors in after that and then blend them in with the OSL? Yeah, that's why I like... I mean, if you if you look back, and I, I could talk about it again too. Like, if I was going to be putting the OSL in, like, say I wanted a red light, you know, hitting... Imagine there's another lightsaber behind him in the same configuration. Come on, you fucking idiot, right? And I'm just going to have it hitting here. If the color that was going to be next to it was going to be, like, the blue, right? Just say that his clothes are actually going to be blue back here. You know, yeah, I would have this blue where that's actually his actual robe color where it's not getting the red light into it. And then, yeah, you would need to do something where it they sort of meet right where there's red going into the the blue a bit um if it's all the same material but part of it's hit by the light and some of it isn't right and that's where i like to just work the osl in in your base coat and then right like if you're gonna add light to the osl you're also gonna add light to the cape that's not from the osl but just from the environment so you're thinking about how you're highlighting that up from whatever other light you have in the scene whether it's ambient light or another directional light or what um, but you kind of want, I like to kind of work them up at the same time, if that makes sense. Like I wouldn't just paint all of your OSL to the end and then go back and try to add all of the other elements in the model. It's going to look fucking weird. <laughs> Probably not going to be a good workflow. Like from here, say if I was doing the, the like, you know, this, say I wanted to do like an off-white, beigey, creamy robes and stuff, right? Like I would want to have been working these these up into some light at some point along the process. Because this is the important thing too, right? Like you want to balance these values against each other a bit. So maybe this is as bright as I'm going to go on this. Is this, you know, not not very white tone, like a very dirty white tone? Maybe that's all this needs for light, to let this stay the star. Because if I go up too high with this, it's not going to make sense compared to the two. I hope that explains it. It's a hard thing to explain sometimes, where it's like... Everything still needs to get rendered, but now you're playing with how much light they're getting and from what source to make the OSL the star. If it needs to be the star sometimes it's a side piece right sometimes it could just be like he's got a little i don't know bobble down here on his belt or, or something and that's what's glowing right like say if 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 this wasn't the thing and this little i know it's a satchel but say this is the thing we wanted to glow 
well maybe that's only just casting like you know a tiny bit of light around it in close proximity down here and then the object itself you know say is this like bright neon color verging into white you know if we want to do this down here then it does it matters less that like maybe this isn't the overall brightest brightest thing on the model it's just that within this area you want it to be sort of the brightest thing right you wouldn't want to do this and then have you know a bright white highlight on the robe here from some other light it's just going to compete it doesn't make sense you'd want to focus on creating a little sense of darkness around it so that you can really feel that yes this is emitting light and it's not getting washed out by another light you know too i mean this is that part of it is there will be a little glazing like at the edges of your light it's nice to glaze that in um just give the idea that, that that light does have that softer fall off and everything but i don't like glazing everything over everything or glazing from the beginning it's just so much extra work um, similarly to, uh, I see a lot of people just whack OSL on with the airbrush. If you're in tabletop stuff, let it rip, like whatever. Um, if you want to do more like refined nuance OSL, the, the airbrush is never going to account for everything at scale, be able to render everything properly. So it's better to go in and learn how to do it by a brush, in my opinion. It's fine too. I mean, if you wanted to go in and sketch in all the values and stuff and maybe glaze in the color with the airbrush, you could try that. I've never had it look good doing that <laughs> myself. So I just don't work that way. All right, anything else? Otherwise, I think I'm going to wrap up the recording part of this, and then um, I'm going to grab a different model and hop down into the painting hangout. So if anybody wants to come hang out and paint, feel free. Okay, bye. Okay, thanks, everybody.